You are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first of two Rooted for Vermont webinar series. Uh, we are very excited to have Job ja Big in the house today. Um, the next one coming up is going to be on April the 14th. So that's going to be live from SBQR. Job ja Big and I are both in the state of California. We are a mere probably 300 miles away. And thanks to modern technology, we are we are able to have this conversation. Uh, first things first, Jia Big, welcome welcome to the uh, Rooted Vermont live webinar. Thanks for being on. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay, now now let's see. I want to set the stage. I feel like your name has been looping around cycling circles for for a little while now, um, on account of some of your recent accomplishments which I think is all the more interesting and fascinating because admittedly you are not a lifelong cyclist. Um, but before we even get into these conversations, first things first, can you please pronounce your full name? Go. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jean-Aimé Vigirimana. And uh, the whole Jabik thing comes from the initials of my, you know, I have a half name name. And, uh, long surname. So I decided that as a DJ, it was going to be, you know, snappier and cooler to just go for Jabeg. So okay. Jabeg is not some sort of like weird, you know, it's not illusion of a condor, you know, it's not something I made up to be, you know, it's not nothing to do with the creator. It's just a Jean Aimé Bigirimana. Well, terrific name. It, it sticks with you. I remember seeing your name for the first time and, and seeing some of those accomplishments. So I, I promise to our pure cycling fans, we will talk about bikes, um, but I'd like to lay a little more groundwork. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, you were born in Rwanda, migrate to Kenya, then South Africa, eventually Montreal, and now despite being on the road a lot, you, you are calling Vancouver home. Tell us about that, that entire span of life. I know that's a big question, but, but. Give us a give us a little bit of backstory there, please. So um, I was born in 1979, so I'm I'm 42 years old, almost 43, you know. So and uh, um, I was born in Rwanda, and in 1988 I moved to Kenya, and um, we quickly. I mean, I spent until 1993 I was in Kenya, and then went back to Rwanda, and. The genocide happened in 1994, so you know we managed to escape it and moved back to Kenya, then South Africa in 1997 or 98, I don't remember. And then we moved to uh, eventually moved to Ken uh, to Canada in 2002, in December 2002, because I'll never forget because it was at the beginning of winter. And if most <laughs> of you have seen Cool Runnings, if you know that film, that was the exact scene. You know, we were like, okay, it's cold, it was okay, and then. We got out of the airport, you know, I'm like, oh, it's not that bad because the first door opened, you know, I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. But what we didn't know is that there's, there's always a second door because, you know, the whole concept of two doors does not exist in, uh, I mean, I had never seen that such a thing in Africa. Okay. And then that wind came, I thought somebody threw a bucket of water on me. And I guess that was Canada. And uh, so I've been here since uh, 2002 and I moved to Montreal and I've been, uh, you know, I guess it's going to be 20 years I've been around. And um, yeah, and um, when I moved to Montreal, I started with my DJ career. I mean, I was already DJing, but I really went pro. You know, since I'm speaking to a pro, let me use big words. I went pro. <laughs> I went pro in uh, 2002. I mean, I was pro, but I went international when I moved to Canada. And that's where I started make, make, uh, name, making a name of myself as a DJ. However, it's only when I started a YouTube channel that everyone around the world started to know who I was. But it wasn't, I mean, they knew who my music were. They knew, they listened to my music and by association knew who I was. And, uh, and ever since, yeah, you know, and I was a DJ, you know, traveling the world, spinning, you know, spinning, you know, different parts. And then one day, I will, it's, it's actually, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but it's a story. Like I got into accident by literal, it's just like a random accident, you know. It's one of the crazy stories. I got, you know, I got a bike and then I got hooked. And six months later, I decided to ride across Canada on a fixed gear bike, you know, starting in winter and eventually ending in winter. 
Um, perfect jump off point right there. So, so you've hit my radar on account of some, well, I guess three major rides. The first one you're just talking about. Let me, let me say the details and jump in if I'm, if I'm saying anything incorrectly. 2015, you went 17,000 kilometers, which is a bit over 10,000 miles all across Canada and ending at the Arctic Circle. Like you said, you did it on a single speed bike. Fixed gear. Um, it's a correct fixed gear. Which supports okay. it. All, yeah. Yes, all the crazier. Um, first and only person in history to cycle across Canada, coast to coast to coast, and by which you mean from what Atlantic to Pacific and then to the northern coast, the Arctic Circle, uh, in winter on a fixed gear bicycle in order, well, not, not necessarily in order to, so I'm curious if this was your goal, you broke the Guinness World Record of longest journey by bicycle in a single country. What was your goal jumping off on that that initial adventure? Actually, my aim wasn't my aim wasn't to start in winter. My aim wasn't to start a Guinness World Record. My aim was to get away because I was feeling a little bit burned out by DJ career. I remember, you know, there was this one club in Montreal that was not named, but you know, I have a lot of Montrealers watching, yeah. and and I've really wanted to DJ there ever since I moved to Montreal. And then one day I got the gig and I go there. And then I was like, oh, is that how it feels? It, it really feels, ah, it's not such a big deal. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and then I told myself, I need, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm almost 40, I'm a DJ, you know, I'm, it's starting to happen that my friends are telling me, hey, my kid was at your club. And, you, yeah. know, and, you know, and I'm like, this is weird. What do I do with the rest of my life? And like I said, I had, I had got into cycling and I found out that when I was riding a bike, that's when, that's when I could think clear you know i could escape into cycling and then when i came back to real life i had a little bit of distance and perspective so then i really got fed up and i said you know what i'm out of here and i decided i'm just gonna go right across canada to clear my mind the average person will walk around the block i guess i needed right. to go around the country yeah but when i thought i'm going to ride across canada i really didn't think much of it for me i was i just want to get away and then everything will sort itself out and the reason I left in January was not because it was a challenge. It's just because I came up with the idea in November and I would have left in, in December, if you know, even November right away. It's just that in December for DJs, it's the most uh, lucrative month because, mm -hmm. you know, with the Christmas parties and New Year's Eve. So I needed to put money aside because I knew I needed, I was going to go for long periods of time without working. And here's the fun part. In my naive mind, I really thought I was going to go from Montreal to the Atlantic Ocean, you know, which is in uh, Newfoundland. Uh -huh. I mean, you might, some of you might need a, a map, but Newfoundland is really far. And then turn around, go to Vancouver, and then go to the Arctic Ocean. And I remember telling everybody, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll be back in six months. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, six months, I was not even back in Montreal because I had to go, you know, to the Atlantic and come back. I was not even back in Montreal. Yeah. And eventually I would finish the following March. You know, a year later, and that was in uh, 2016, by the way. So I rode across Canada between 2016 and 2017. Okay. So the trip was actually two winters. You know, so some people, you know, because sometimes people will say, "But there's not a year of winter in Canada." I'm like, first of all, it's Canada. Winter starts early and finishes, you know, late. So right. Right. I did. I rode from January until. Um, April uh, until March or April the following year. And mm -hmm. I remember getting to Montreal. I mean, like in May, it was still snowing where I was. And yeah. then I went through June. And then by the time I got to October into the Rocky Mountains, it was already snowing again, you know? So I got the, into the Rocky Mountains when it was snowing. And from October until January, it was snowing, you know? I mean, actually at some stage it stopped snowing because it was so cold, it wouldn't snow anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was minus 40. And minus 40, that's when the, you know, Celsius and Fahrenheit meet. So yeah. minus 40, that, I did a little bit of that. So, so the, the intention wasn't to go right across Canada. It was just to get away. And, and then nobody believed it. You know, the mechanics, and actually the mechanics, you know, initially when they set my bike, because I had to go get another frame that was a little bit more, you know, up, because I'd learned a new word, it was less aggressive. Uh -huh. So I've been doing some homework 
I'm learning some technical cycling turns so that I don't embarrass myself. So I'd, I'd gotten a less aggressive frame that could take wider tires. And, okay. you know, and so even when, even the mechanics, when they set my bike, they set it in single speed. And I'm like, no, I want it fixed to They're like, you can't do it. I'm like, you can't do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And everyone was like, okay. You know, that whole Canadian polite way as in, mm-hmm. Sure, you know, meaning he's crazy, but because we're polite, we don't say that. Right. And and my friends were like, first of all, you had a cold in winter, even in, in the in the 15 or 16 years you've been in Canada. All the time in winter, you get up, you know, you leave Montreal and you go spend winters somewhere warm. Mm-hmm. You don't like the cold and you don't like risk. What are you going to do? Why, why are you doing that? And so people knew, those who don't know me uh, well knew I was just going to go and then come back. Now, those who know me, they were worried because they knew I would come back in a casket before admitting defeat. And that actually what worried my parents and my siblings. They knew I was going to be so stubborn that I would probably die before coming home. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a whole, like, you know, dark podcast. But then I went. And for me, um, honestly, the biggest thing was to get started because... I'm, a, I'm actually very risk averse, you know, I'm not a risk taker and, you know, and I know people are going to say that you've done this, but I'm not really a risk taker, you know, I, I like love to be safe. And for me, the biggest accomplishment when was leaving them, you know, leaving my house. Because once I left the house and I was outside in the cold, I knew, okay, the, the hardest part is done. You sure. know, I'm just going forth. So I, I got into cycling in New England um in new hampshire and vermont which are very close to montreal we know a thing or two about what it's like to be in cold weather also it's taken me the better part of 20 years to acquire the right clothing and hardware and figure out those tricks and tips that allow me to get through a winter like what is going to keep my hands warm what is going to keep my toes warm so that i don't feel like it's dangerous so then raise the bar to going further north starting from montreal and at that point, how far into your, call it, cycling career are you? Because you had only recently picked up cycling, is that right? Yeah. So I was, I got my bike in June. And okay. I decided to do the trip in October, November. And the reason also I came up, up with the idea was, like I said, I need to, you know, a reminder, I'm a DJ. So for me, you know, I'm not like most DJs work Monday to Sunday, you know. Okay. I'm, I like life, so I usually work Friday, Saturday, no, hang on, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday okay. evenings. So during the days, I have a lot of free time. And so when I, when, I, when I got into cycling, I would just ride from Monday to Monday to Friday because I learned something important. When you're a DJ, you don't want to ride on a, bus, a bicycle the, the, during the day because when you're standing, the middle, you know, when you're standing for like six hours, Yep. The cramps come knocking, you know. So I learned very quickly that I don't ride a bike the day when I'm DJing. Okay. And so I was riding a lot of distances. And within one summer, uh, somebody had told me, you need to join this site called Strava. Yep. You know, it's this little thing that, you know, you can just log your distances. So I looked at this Strava thing and I said, oh, wow, you know, I've covered 5,000 kilometers. I don't know what it is in mileage. I used I don't use the... Uh, about 3,000 miles. Yep. Yeah. And I told myself, oh, that's almost from Montreal to Vancouver. And I'm like, oh, I've ridden from Montreal to Vancouver. Yeah. So in my head, I was like, oh, wow, you know. And then one day I was like, I'm going to ride from Montreal to Vancouver. Uh-huh. But then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do all of Canada. So it was within six, in less, in less than six months. That's when I came up with all this. And by yeah. the way, when I got my bike, because, you know, I got the new bike and the new frame and with the tires. Uh-huh. I think I rode the bike once, and then the following day, that's when I started my journey. Oh, my word. Everything about it is so <laughs> impressive. Um, how, much, how much logistical planning did you have? I mean, did you know point to point or roughly the distances you were going to go? Or what are the logistics that allow you to sleep at night with a roof over your head? Or are you are you camping out? So I decided to... So basically one thing I do is like, I've never come to my life, you know, and I've never done anything crazy like that. Okay. So I figured, okay, I'm going to ride a bike 
first of all, I'm going to go back to, you know, like, because I've learned about, you know, back then backpacking did not exist. It was back touring, you know, yep. I'm going to do back touring and I'm going to go from one place to another place. And yep. I've never ridden a bike in winter. So that's already the one challenge. And now I'm going to have to camp. I'm like, okay, let's come, so, you know, let's me, let, let, let me calm myself down. I'm doing like white people stuff, you know, and I'm just going to stick to cycling because the riding in winter and the camping, that's a little bit too much. I'm going to stick yeah. to the whole cycling. Okay. And I figured also it's going to allow me not to have to carry around a lot of weight because I'm in fixed gear and I've ridden, I've, I've driven enough distance to know the challenges that the challenges were the hills, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I figured I'm going to stay with friends and that's where the beauty of being a DJ helps. I know a lot of people. Sure. Well, let me put it this way. A lot of people know of me. So I figured I'm just going to start with my friends and then we're going to get around. And, you know, I'd also heard about a website called Catch Surfing and another one called Warm Showers, which is Catch Surfing, but for cyclists. It's basically cyclist hosting cyclists. Cool. So I decided I'm just going to go with that. And really, when I started, uh, it was just to get to Quebec. Quebec was like 200 kilometers away. Let me start with a city called Trois Rivières and then Quebec. And I just keep going one, you know, one day at a time. So before I knew it, I was, you know, on the Atlantic coast. And then I was like, it wasn't that bad. What is everyone fussing about? Yes, it was cold and this and that. Yeah. And then I turned around, but then that's when I discovered what a headwind was. Exactly. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, <laughs> there's a prevailing west to east wind across at least the United States. I imagine it's the same thing up north. Yeah, it's the same thing. I was a hot tailwind because for those who are into fixed gear, you know, I started at like a 46 and 17 gear ratio. Okay. Which is pretty hard for somebody, you know, with weight, I mean, carrying some cargo and also going up hills and on mountains. But then when mm -hmm. I turned around, I remember going to the back shop and saying, hey, please lower my gear ratio. I can't take it anymore. This one is just killing me. That's yeah. when we really discovered that cycling is not about the hills, it's about mm -hmm. the wind. Mm -hmm. So I started fussing about the weather, stopping, I stopped uh, fussing about the weather. And now every morning, what I cared about was the wind. And if it would be too windy, I would just take a break and wait for the following day and then ride yeah. longer. Because even a short distance with the wind, it was just too demoralizing. You know, I, I mean, and I remember that I think a few of the times I almost quit wasn't because of the weather. It was because of the wind. I mean, the wind is part of the weather, but I'm talking about temperatures versus yep. the wind. So we could we could make this talk entirely about that initial journey, but <laughs> yes. I prefaced, I prefaced uh, introducing your cycling by saying you've hit my radar on account of three major rides. That was the first. The next, uh, I think it was August 2018, you set out on an attempt to ride the entire world. Uh, 100,000 2019? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Correct. Uh, on on what was what was estimated to be a five year, hundred thousand kilometer or sixty thousand mile journey. Obviously, the 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 way the world has unfolded, we you quickly ran into a thing called COVID. How did you certainly traveled quite a bit leading up to that? How did that trip go? Well, first of all, I want to admit here for the first time in public that COVID, COVID saved my dignity because I was way underprepared, way underfunded, way under everything, you know? Okay. And then COVID happened. I was like, I mean, it seems wrong because people passed away and, you know, and it, it paralyzed the world. But when it comes to my trip, it really was, I was not, I mean, it was a, Riding around Canada was one thing, around the world was another. But I managed to get through from uh, Montreal to Boston, and then from Boston, I flew to the United Kingdom and across the UK, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, France, Switzerland. And, and then I was in Switzerland and life was so expensive. I think what I spent in Switzerland was maybe 70% maybe of my, all my budget was spent in oh, Switzerland. Wow. Because Switzerland, I mean, I thought Switzerland was expensive, but it was really expensive. And that's yeah. with friends hosting me and, you know, and people taking care of me. Just, I mean, wow. I discovered that 
if anyone is listening, do not book a train ticket on the same day in Switzerland. Never do that. Never make that mistake. And don't think that like most countries, a bicycle is free to bring your bicycle into the train. It's okay. not, you know. So okay. Switzerland was, uh, was expensive. And then I decided to take a break to go back to uh, around Christmas to go to, to the UK to DJ because London is the city where I get the most bookings because that's where I, I'm, you know, I have the most notoriety. Okay. And, and then I DJed and when I was about to go back to Switzerland to resume the ride, you know, we heard about this thing in Asia that was paralyzing Asia. And then before I knew it, the Canadian um, High Commission, which is the embassy, they called me and they said, you need to go back home. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And the reason they call me is just because when I travel abroad, I always register myself so that if something happens, you know, it's always something I do and people say, why are you so paranoid? I'm like, well, it worked because they did call me and they said, you need to go home. You know, the borders, like, you know, the, the Europe is called shutting down its borders. I'm like, Europe doesn't have borders. What are you talking about? You know, it's, it's the EU. But then, yes, they were shutting down borders. And then, you know, the, the person at the High Commission told me, you need to go back home. It's anyway, it's two weeks to flatten down. You know, it's two weeks to flatten out the, you know, the curve, whatever it is. And then I went back home and yeah, you know, the rest is nothing happened. It's not even history, nothing happened. So yeah, so I'd, I'd set up to go on a, uh, on a ride to raise funds for World Bicycle Relief. Because the first journey across Canada was just something I did for myself. And then the second time, because I remember everyone kept telling me, what are you riding for? I'm like, what do you mean? What charity are you riding for? I'm like, I'm not riding for a charity. I'm, I just want to see Canada and escape for a second, you know? And then I realized that mm -hmm. for some weird reason, you cannot go on a bicycle ride until, you know, unless there's a charity, charitable element to it. And I decided, okay, you know, actually, I'd like to send some bicycles to children in Africa because it's something that's important to me. For me, I ride bikes for fun, but for them, it can just, you know, some kids can get to school. And then, I'm, and then I figured mm -hmm. that's a very cool idea, but I'm sure somebody out there must have come up with it. So then I went on Google and typed in, and then I went, I came across World Bicycle Relief, and that blew my mind because they, they had thought of something I never thought of, which is to create a whole industry behind it. Because I realized that what I wanted to do was noble, but not smart, because once you, you want to send a bicycle somewhere, unless you're sending the parts, you're busy you're pretty much dumping something because once the bag breaks down, then what happens? But World Bicycle Relief would actually send the components to parts of Africa. And then from there, have someone build the bikes, creating a whole industry. And that was very, you know, I like that. So then I contacted them. I said, this is what I want to do. Do you mind if I, do you mind if I, you know, raise funds for you? And they said, yeah, sure. So I said, okay, this is going to be to see the world, but also to raise funds for World Bicycle Relief. Which I managed to do, however, the pandemic, you know, ruined those dreams. That is incredible. Um, and so, yeah, to shamelessly throw it out there, what what is not shamelessly? It's such a great organization. What is the link? How can people find uh, your fundraising link? Um, it's I mean, I have my fundraising link, but right now I can't link to it, so I don't know where it is. But just go to Google World Bicycle Relief and just make a donation. It doesn't matter whether you donate through my link or not. You know what matters is that people do get, you know, the 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 charity gets the the, the funds, and then they really, you know, unlike most charities where you say what happened to the money, you can actually you donate the money and then you can see the bicycle. You know, I mean, you can see, but you can. It's something tangible. Because some charity you send money, hey, we're gonna feed people, or we're going to build this, and then you're like, where's the thing? Where's the this that you get money for? And you never, you know, you never see it. What bicycle relief? You actually see the children, the bicycles, or the farmers, or the, or or the health practitioners. You know, you actually see. And the bicycle is such something. For us, it's so it's for fun. For you, I mean, for me, it's for fun. For you, it's your, you know, profession. Hopefully, it's fun for you too. You know, but it in some parts of the world is to open, you know, to give opportunities to others, because it's hard to believe that the reason some people don't go to school is because they can't get to school because school is too far. And that's just crazy, you know. I mean, that's just insane, actually. So, if a bicycle can close the gap, to use another technical term I learned, you know, to get ready, you know, close the gap, and why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, how about 
can you tell me tell us about the the current trip that you're on because now you're on uh a trip across north america i think probably as a result of covid like you said you were brought back uh to north america you're on you're on something of an adventure as we speak so tell us about the the current big one that you're on please yeah i think um as far as i'm concerned i think riding around the world in today's world after covid and then with what's going on around the world it seems like now after covid everyone have decided to I don't know, wars have started. So I figured now I'm just going to do a few places that I've wanted to ride all my life. And, you know, as a Canadian citizen, you know, come to the U.S. often. But I figured, you know, I know the U.S. from at the end of the day, all I know about the U.S. is from the little I've seen and what I know from the media. And I like to see things with my very own eyes. So I decided, let me go ride around the U.S. And why not? And yes, I, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm not raising funds riding around the world, but I'm running around the US, why not raise funds for World Bicycle Relief? So I decided to just do a whole loop around the US, you know, within the continental US, because some people say, hey, that's not the whole US. There's Alaska miss missing, and there's Hawaii missing, and I'm like, okay. But most people know the US as being continental US, you know? And it's most, and anyway, I'm only to do Alaska because I did it parallel when I was in Canada. So, you know, it's the same thing, you know, from, yeah. From White Horse all the way to the Arctic Ocean, it's the same thing as going through Alaska. So I decided to ride along the Pacific coast, along um, along um, along the Pacific coast, and along. Oh, where are you? Ooh. I lost you. Sorry. I need to. My phone no, you're right. It rings on my my laptop, and it just. Yeah, so I decided to ride around the U.S. Uh, within um, uh, along the Pacific, Mexican border, Atlantic, and then along the Canadian border, all within the U.S. So starting and ending in Seattle, and I have six months to do it because as a Canadian citizen, I can I'm allowed to stay in the U.S. for six months. So I have to do it in, within six months. But I'm already uh, running behind. So I might have to chop some bits and pieces, you know, like for instance, South Florida, I might have to say goodbye to it. And instead of going all the way to Portland, I might have to stop in Boston, even New York City. And who knows, even when I get north and I'm, and I'm you know, I'm running out of time, I might, I might have to do North Dakota, Montana, which are nothing much going on there. And I'm sorry if we from there, you know, I might have to do it within Canada <laughs> and then goes back into the Cascade Mountains. And I'll let you guess why the Cascade Mountains, you know, has something to do with our friends at Ray Hearst, you know, because they talk about them so much that I had to go check them out for myself. And then, and then from mm -hmm. there, meet up with some people from Rafa and uh, Ray Hearst actually that are going to come and meet me. And we're gonna do the whole finale in Seattle, you know. Hopefully, I'm gonna have both of my legs that are still working. Mm -hmm. How about the? We we talked about it a little bit before going live here. Talk to the audience and, and give me even more information about some of the logistical details, because there are things you might need on a particular day, but you might not need for a few more days at a time. So how, how much stuff are you carrying versus perhaps packing and, and shipping up the road? So when I crossed the border from Vancouver into Seattle, you know, and I had everything, you know, to quote another expression I learned, but the kitchen sink, you know? And I had like my laptop, I had my, you know, I had PJs, I had everything, I had shoes, I had everything. And when I hit the first hill in, you know, from Bellingham to Seattle, and that's when I rode, I rode with Jan from Renner Harris, you know, I was like, I mean, like I was trying to save face and ride as fast as he can because he's very fast, he's like, he's very fast. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to Seattle, I was completely broken and tired. So I decided to get rid of a lot of stuff. So I left some of the stuff in Seattle and the other, the others, uh, somebody told me that there's something in the US where you can get a box, and it's a box big like this, and you can throw things in there and you can send it anywhere you want in the US for 20 bucks. You know, weight doesn't matter, you can, as long as the content fits in that box, you can send it for 20 bucks. So then I decided my laptop, shoes, things I don't know need every day, they're going to go in there and I'm going to send them to the major cities where I'm going. So I send it to, I send it to Portland, then San Francisco and Los Angeles, where I am right now. 
And after this, because I need to make up for lost time, I'm going to send it all the way to Austin. So until I get to Austin, I'm not going to be able to shave. I'm not going to be able to use my laptop. I'm not going to be able to use my, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to wear shoes. I'm just going to have to wear my cycling shoes. Basically anything that can save weight <laughs> because I need to, you know, for me, the less weight I have, the faster I can go, but also the, the less tired I am. So I can ride big journey, I mean, big rides every single day. So like right now, the day, I mean, the reason I'm actually talking to you right now was because, and you know, I knew we were doing this today. So I waited for a bit, but after I speak to you tomorrow, I'm going to the post office and this laptop is being shot and sent in, you know, being sent forward. Very good thinking. Um, what, I could probably reverse engineer it and do the math. What kind of distances are you doing on any given day or maybe any given week? So I ride according to accommodation. Again, I don't camp because I don't want to camp, you know. And again, and the reason I don't want to camp, I know that back touring is about camping. For most of most people, that's what they look forward to. For me, I want to ride my bicycle. I don't want to camp. I don't want to carry anything. The reason I even have like a pannier, mm -hmm. I mean one bag, is because I need to carry things. If it were up to me, I would have, if I were a pro like you, I would have a team following me. Somebody had, the only thing I would have on my bike would be this. Not even two, one of uh -huh. these, and have somebody handing, you know, handing them to me, and you know, like, you know, when you're riding, and then somebody has a bottle, I just snatch it and I drink it, and then I throw him one, this and that, and I keep going, uh, you know. But life is not this way, so I have to carry something minimal, you know, like my PJs and toothbrush and everything, and yeah. So, the, so that means that my my daily distances are, are determined by where I'm spending the night, and so. And most so in average it's 120 kilometers, but also I've also done mm -hmm. journeys of 180. And where I'm headed in the in the desert, I might have to do like daily distances of 200 kilometers. But obviously I can ride 200 kilometers yeah. every day. So what I'm gonna do is ask the host if I can stay an extra night, so that ride every second day 200 kilometers. And there's some parts of the country where you know I don't want to get all political, but Everyone, anyone who has a brain can figure out what I mean. Those I just want to even do like 300 kilometer days, like you know, start early in the morning and just ride my bike, you know, as you know, stay in the big gear and just like pedal forth. So, mm -hmm. to answer your question, it depends, but on average, on average, it's 120 kilometers, and I don't know what it is in miles, but it's probably like 80 or something like that. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, just shy of 80. I mean, yeah, very impressive distances day after day after day, which would lead me to the next question. Have you, in all of these travels, have you had any overuse injuries? Um, actually, I didn't know that when I got, because I wanted to uh, upgrade my saddle, uh, everything, but when I upgraded mm -hmm. my saddle, I got the right brand and the right everything, but I, wrong, I got the wrong size. I mean, I didn't know saddles had sizes until it right. started hurting. So my, you know, so, so from day one, I was in pain. So I rode for a month in absolute agony. And I couldn't figure out why, because I rode that saddle around Europe, you know, the, like the first trip, you know, the first trip uh, in Europe and the second time across Canada, because that's one thing we forgot to mention. I rode across Canada during the pandemic, actually. And, uh -huh. and the saddle was okay, but I couldn't figure out why it was giving me so much grief. And it turns out it's, it was the wrong size. But it was the damage was already done. That's why I had to sit here for th in, for three weeks, and until now, even when I sit on a wooden chair, it hurts, you know. So, so now, you know, yeah. I went to a backfitter here called Steve. He's like a somebody everyone knows, you know, swears by, swear by in the city. And I went and he fixed me, you know. Some I'm ready to hit the road. But when it comes to technicalities, so far, you know, knock on wood, nothing happens because I'm, uh, you know, I am back chondriac. You don't even know that term. I just thought you a new term, you know. And what happened is that whenever in a major city, I just get my back serviced. Even I'll, I usually take my back and they're like, oh, so what's wrong? I'm like, nothing, but it's a bike yeah. and it wants to break down. So can you please uh, tell me, you know. And turns out my, you know, my what I do is sound. Because, for instance, when I went to San Francisco and I went to above category, they told me you need new bearings for your wheel. Like, what is that? Okay. I said, no, don't worry. I'll write it an email. So then I got the email and I forwarded it to Shram and Zip and I said, I need 
new bearings. And they sent it to me in LA and, you know, and, uh, and I got the new bearings because, and it turns out my bearing was so bad that if I'd got into the desert, you know, the, I would have gotten a problem. So prevention is better than cure. Other than that, you know, I mean, and the tires, you know, I like to joke around that I don't even know how to fix tires. And people say, what do you mean you don't have to fix tires? I'm like, well, because I ride on tires that don't tend to puncture. That's why I don't know how to fix a flat because I seldom get flats. And when I do, you know, two less mm-hmm. takes care of it. Or, you know, if it's really bad, you know, I've learned to do the plug thing. So I just plug, you know, and everything is okay. And also when I ride, you know, because I'm so paranoid, I look, you know, people sometimes will say, oh, how are the mountains today? Did you enjoy the scenery? I'm like, actually, I didn't. I was too busy looking at the street, at the floor. Especially I found that in California, they throw a lot of bottles. I don't know why, but California and Oregon, they throw a lot of bottles, you know, on their ground. And somebody told me that apparently because if the police catches you with a bottle in the car, that's automatically, they assume that we're drinking and driving. So I guess when people drink, they just chuck the bottles on the road for us at least to ride over and get flats. I mean, them, not me, because like I said, I have sure. pump tires, I mean, puncture resistant, which means that in this kind uh-huh. of week, I mean, all the punctures on the planet, because you know how it is, you know, when you run your mouth, then you run out of sealant. So I'm probably going to get all the flats right. this coming week. Yeah. Which... Yeah, I mean, talking about hardware, uh, how, how do you choose a tire? Are you trying to fit just the widest tire in because it's going to be the most comfortable? Or have you, I mean, even going back to the, to the trip in Canada, uh, you probably had tread at some point. The question being, how do you choose a tire? Well, there's this man called Ted King, and he wrote an article in, in a blog called, uh, you know, by Rene Harris that says how I choose my tires. And he's a bicycle racer. So I figured I'm going to take everything he says and divide it by 100 because, you know, I'm a normal human being, you know, like, you know, this and that. So I ride an open upper uh-huh. frame, which has a lot of clearance. And it can go up to yep. uh, 40, 40 millimeters. And so I decided the rule of thumb is just go as wide as possible because, you know, the issue is not with the width, it's with the casing. And if you have good casting, then the width doesn't matter. But also for me, it's actually more comfortable to have a wider tire because it's less prone to, it's more comfortable because it's, uh, you know, the width and I can put low pressure, which also makes it less prone to to punctures, which actually is also a lifesaver because let's say, for instance, if there's a pothole and I'm on a tight road and there's, there's traffic behind me, I don't need to swerve into traffic mm-hmm. and dodge it or do, or do uh, bunny hops. I just go straight and I'm like, okay, I guess that was it. And the tire will take it because it's wide. And and I take the sure. endurance casing just because, like I said, I'm not very comfortable with flats. And even though they they don't, you know, they don't flat often, but it's that peace of mind. Because at the end of the day, uh, most of the cycling for me, I find it's peace of mind. If I have peace of mind about something, then I'm more comfortable. Because also that stress, am I going to get a flat? Am I going to get flat? That's not good stress to have. So I just take the most right. puncture resistant. And I mean, I don't really feel the change in in speed because I'm not I'm not, you know, I'm not out there to be the fastest. But I don't even notice I wouldn't even notice, you know. All I know is that I notice it compared to the hard casings. And so yeah, so I pick the biggest, uh, the widest size my 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 bike can fit, and then that's it. So actually, if you know, if the company Wink Wink had met like a very slick 55 because right now they're on the 55. I would have probably gotten a 650B uh, wheel and put the biggest, you know, mm-hmm. 55, and, you know, the slick on it just for the extra width and also the, you know, for the extra comfort. Because for me, I mean, I'm not the fastest cyclist. I'm not, you know, I'm not fast. Uh, I'm not fast at all. But I find that the less time I can get off a bike because of I'm taking breaks, that's how I make up my time. You know, if if, I, if, if instead of an hour and a half on one of my rides, if I take just like half an hour, then that's a whole hour saved. Mm-hmm. And most of it is through the tires and yeah. some other components. Because if I'm comfortable, I, mean, I, don't need, I don't need to stop. And that's why with the saddle, I was losing so much time. 
because I kept stopping to you know to rest my bum, and hopefully now it's gonna be I'm gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm often asked how do I choose my tires, and and I'm doing races that might be three hours long or, or ten hours long. Certainly not ten thousand kilometers or ten thousand miles effectively doing this time trial you're doing but but we both bark up the same tree which is a flat tire is going to slow you down so i end up typically choosing the more durable tire uh in competition but also knowing that you know renee Harris has has this wonderful spread of extra light to standard to uh endurance or endurance plus and they're all they're all incredibly uh i mean they're incredibly fast tires there's the counter intuition that a wide tire is going to slow you down, but like, pardon me for the wild motorcycle. Uh, it is, it's completely counterintuitive and it, it, it's not slowing you down. What does yeah. slow you down is having a flat tire. And, yeah. and the whole army of it. Cool because that sorry. No, go ahead. No, the whole army of it is that I've ridden the, like the extra light on the, on the, and the standard casing and I've, and mm -hmm. the few flats I've had were on the hard ones, not on the light ones. So it means that at the end of the day, yeah, uh, flats most of the most of the time it's a matter of bad luck than anything, you know. And but for me, like I yeah. said, you know, the extra light, which make a difference, you know. I mean, like the extra, it's crazy. Like the nobis on extra light, you know, you can feel the difference, mm -hmm. you know, versus for instance like a slick. Like you know the the endurance one, you can just feel it. But like I said, for me it's just peace of mind, you know. And like I said, if I were more if I were more comfortable with flats and this and that, then I would just ride you know like the 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 extra light because the comfort and the the speed is is pretty noticeable. However, you know, mm -hmm. I stick with like I said, peace of mind is important to me. But if I'm in Mont let's say for instance if mm -hmm. I'm in Vancouver or I'm in Montreal, then I stick with extra light because you know if if I have a flat, first of all, it's gonna seal itself. But if it's if it's bad, yeah, I know who to call. <laughs> some some of my friends, unfortunately, they know yeah. by now that when I call them, it's time for them to come and pick me up wherever I am. <laughs> nice. Um, how do you how do you approach the perspective of these enormous rides? Um, it's sort of a question of. Are you looking at the forest? Are you looking at the trees? Do you look at each day as just one day at a time? Or are you looking at the huge picture and saying, okay, I am whatever, 10% through this entire journey or 25% through? Or just what is your perspective on these rides? Well, if I think I'm going to ride around the US, that's the easiest way to chicken out and to drive myself crazy. You know, like for instance, <laughs> right now, my next destination is I'm going to. San Diego. And then when I get to San Diego, mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm going to Phoenix, which is which is pretty much I count on a weekly basis. And then when I get to Phoenix, you know, I'm gonna say I'm going to Tucson. So I learned it's Tucson, not Tucson. It's Tucson. <laughs> Correct. You know, and there I'm actually bumping into a mutual friend, you know, Lyle. You know, I'm excited. She's oh, gonna nice. be doing her she's gonna be doing her chant trial in Arizona, you know, wishing her well. But I might, Perfect. she might be finished by the time I get there. But I know she's very fast, so I might bump into her. And and then from uh -huh. there, from, from Tucson, I'm going all the way to Austin. So it's basically on a weekly basis. So planning like you know on a weekly basis. But I I just know that generally speaking, I want to be in New York City in June because I have digital things to do. Uh, but other than that, I just pretty much take it like on a weekly basis. Otherwise, it's just too much logistics to, to, to deal with. And also, I don't have my laptop. So I need my laptop to, you know, to document everything, you know, to organize the where I'm going to be spending the night and, you know, run my finances and this and that. So on a weekly basis is what keeps it manageable. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Um, and how about... I know your motivation initially to do that first trip, it was like you said, to clear your mind, to go on this, this, this sort of outlandish journey. What is your motivation now to have done the, the, you know, the trip in 2019 or to do this one now? Is it 
is it world bicycle relief is it you know the selfish love for cycling that i think any cyclist has is it a cool way to see the world or or all of the above well it's actually a it's a it's a funny question because i had like i mean on the bicycle if you write you know people think that run being on a bicycle is running away from your prob problems it's actually the worst it's facing your problems because you're on a bike especially if you if you're climbing a big hard pass you need to distract yourself. So you usually go into your thoughts. And I've been wondering, at this stage, am I riding for social media applause or am I riding for social cause? What, or is it for myself? What am I doing? And then I came up with a conclusion that mm -hmm. life doesn't have to be black and white. It can just be, you know, a little bit of white, pink, navy blue. And it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So my motivation is to see the US, first and foremost. Excuse me, first and foremost, because the whole irony of the thing, and again, maybe it's not politically correct to say such a thing, or I shouldn't show my cards, but actually raise more money as a DJ when I'm spinning. If I throw a party and I have people coming and they pay tickets and this and that, I will actually raise more money than riding a bike. Because at the end of the day, you know, people donating to a cause like he's riding a bike, there's nothing in it for them. But if I'm doing a party and they're coming and they're dancing and they're having food and this and that. That's more selfish because they're paying for something that benefits them directly. They're going to donate, you know. So as a matter of efficiency, riding a bicycle, for me, it's not actually the most efficient. It would be to throw a party and DJ because that's something that, you know, if we're talking about like efficiency, like to raise money. I mean, in the pandemic, I was having parties from a laptop. I was DJing at home and getting them from my DJ equipment and playing songs. And I was raising more money for the World Bicycle, World Bicycle Relief than when I'm riding a bike. So, yeah. but riding a bike around the US, I get to do the three things at the same time, which is to escape and take some air, you know, discover the United States and have a lot of friends here. Oh my gosh, I'm against the light. Oh, yeah. To discover the US and also to ride my bike and to also, you know, like the pandemic, I think by, by, by summer, I'm going to be done with the pandemic. The pandemic is going to be done. So I'm going to go back to DJing. So it's going to be back. You know, I'm sort of like, it's like going on a big holiday before I go back to being a DJ. Mm -hmm. However, I'm loving this cycling too much that now I'm going to be incorporating into my, into my, into my DJing. Like for instance, when, whenever I usually travel, I usually travel by, by, you know, a fly or a drive. This time, why not? Mm -hmm. You know why not uh, cycle? We just arrange this. Yeah, perfect answer. I mean, yeah, the efficiency is such a common word in cycling. It's 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 what allows you to move quickly. It allows you to move more quickly. Uh, to you know, just learning strength to weight ratios and you know the more most pliable tire and all these things, but. It's cool to see a much bigger picture of what you're talking about efficiency of high school for this this current chapter. Um, well, to be perfectly honest, I feel like I could ask you questions again back on that original trip across Canada, coast to coast to coast, nonstop for about three hours. But for the sake of your rest, for the sake of the planning that you have to do, I'm going to let you uh, continue on your journey. I am incredibly grateful for your time this uh this afternoon this evening um i'm 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 psyched to be following along so thank you for everything you're doing for the sport of cycling and and for djing and for producing the music that you produce uh it is it's incredible so thank you very much job big thank you for having me all righty folks um yeah, huge thanks to Jobbing for being on this live webinar with Rooted Vermont. Uh, the next one is going to be, I want to say is a Thursday, April 14th. Uh, we're going to be at SPQR with Chef Matt Acarino. And that's all I got. Uh, please share this share this video if you found it interesting or informative. And that is that is all. So have a great night. Job big. Good luck with the next 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 piece of the journey and then onward after that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.